Have you ever wondered why some Christian leaders manage to transform impossible situations while others fail miserably despite an abundance of resources? The mystery grows when those who have led God's people with distinction suddenly lose their ability to lead. How does that happen? And how can we avoid a trap that has snared and destroyed so many once effective Christian leaders? Listen in as Vicki Hitzkiss, Nathan Norman, and Kent Edwards solve this mystery by looking at the leadership of Saul and Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapters 13 to 15. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of 1 Samuel. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to 1 Samuel chapters 13 to 15 as we join their discussion. Following up on Brian's observation on leadership, Nathan, Vicki, have you ever seen leaders lose their effectiveness over time? I have to think about it. I'm sure I have. Yeah, I had a mentor, and actually, he he's one of the reasons why I'm in the ministry to begin with. He was one of the voices when I was a young man, just saying, oh, you you need to go into the ministry. You need to do this ministry. And then we lost uh, contact over the course of, I don't know, 10 years or so. But, but man, he really built into me. He gave me opportunities to preach and teach and to learn and grow, and he'd give me feedback. And we lost track of each other over the course of 10 years or so. And then I reconnected with him on Facebook not too long ago. And so I was like, hey, how's it going? You know, good to hear from you. And uh, I just kind of gave him the the bird's eye view of my life in, in the last few years. Hey, here's everything that's happened. And I'm like, so, you know, what, what's been going on with you? And I didn't hear anything. And well, maybe he didn't see it, right? So you nudge it. Hey, so what's going on with you? And and I mentioned it to my wife, and she said it's because he's he's not doing anything. You you realize hmm. he he stopped doing ministry or was unable to do ministry or wasn't effective at doing ministry, so no one would let him do ministry, and he's feeling ashamed. And hmm. I'm like, how did you get that? She's like, that's what's happening. And, and sure enough, that's that's what happened. He he reached a point maybe three or four years after we lost touch with each other. And, and that was kind of the end of ministry. Wow. Oh, that's too bad. I remember having a pastor who from the distance was highly successful in planting a church and growing its ministry. And later on in life, um, had the opportunity for our lives to intersect again. And man, it just wasn't there. I mean, he was going through the motions, but leading, finding new vistas. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't really happening. I wasn't sure, you know, why Why does that happen? Maybe it was age. Maybe he got tired. Maybe um, it was because he was now in a different kind of community and didn't understand that community well. I, You know, I think there's probably a lot of different reasons why someone can lose the effectiveness that they had as a leader in another setting. But in 1 Samuel, the narrator puts his finger on a very significant and insidious cause of leadership failure. Before we jump in uh, for Samuel 13, let's remember the context. Samuel was forced into retirement when Israel demanded a king who would fight for them, like all the other nations. God warned them of the consequences, but he allowed them to sin. God did everything possible to give King Saul a good start as the leader of God's people including winning a decisive battle, saving the city of Jabesh Gilead. Actually, a very impressive victory. But in chapter 13, a leadership problem emerged, as they often do. Starting in verse 18, what is the narrator telling us? It says the Philistines, the army, camped in Israel at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. Not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a spear or sword in hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. So Nathan, help us understand, why is this situation so scary for Israel? 
they don't have the weapons to fight their enemies. They, they've got nothing. And and they're re- reliant on their enemies to sharpen the things that they can use <laughs> for <laughs> weapons. Uh, it's just unreal. And the Philistines are a warlike people, right? I mean, the, the Israelites are basically farmers. So, I mean, they work hard. They're good people. Right. But the Philistines weren't good farmers. They were good at stealing other people's farm goods. Right. They specialized in military expertise. And they, as you say, they had the weapons. Right. They wouldn't be able to count how many swords they had. <laughs> they come in with those swords and the Israelites come out with broomsticks. You know, right. that's, uh, that's just not going to go well. Okay. So what follows after this introduction of this major crisis for Israel are actually two stories. Uh, two stories that are intertwined. One story dealing with Saul and the other Jonathan. And the stories are contrasted. It begins in verse 23. And then in 14, verse 1. Okay, it says, Now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Hmm. So Jonathan, so both Jonathan and Saul are, see the same problem. Jonathan decides to respond by telling his young armor bearer, some kid who probably hadn't even begun to shave yet. Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost. Is is that leadership? Yeah, absolutely. There's a problem. Sounds like it. Let's let's do some recon. Yeah, he's he's taking charge and he's leading. Ah, he's only leading a person of one, but he's leading. Um, <laughs> um, by the way, what is Saul doing in verse two and three? What does the narrator tell us? He's hanging out at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just. It Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. So the narrator's drawing a contrast. What are the differences between Jonathan and Saul? Well, like Nathan just said, one was hanging out at the bar and the other one was going (laughs) into action, going to do something about the problem that they didn't have any weapons. So it wasn't quite a bar, but it, you know, it's under a pomegranate tree. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> the pomegranate, as you know, trees are famous for their fruit. It's very sweet. If it uh, had grown for a while, it's called a tree. So, you know, would have provided shade. Uh, can't you just see it? In a lounge chair with one of those little drinks, you know, the fruity drinks with the, with the umbrella in them. He's sitting under a pomegranate tree in the shade, surrounded by whom? All those men, 600 of them. 600 men. And Jonathan had how many? One. One guy, right? So Jonathan goes into action. (laughs) Saul goes into uh, lazy Saturday afternoon mode. Interesting. The story continues. What does Jonathan do next, starting in verse 4? It says, On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. This is a gutsy guy. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I'm with you, heart and soul. Isn't it fascinating to see Jonathan in action? He is leading and confident in God's ability to help them succeed. Right? And yep. by the way, what's Saul doing? Again, he's under the tree. <laughs> he's under the tree. Drink number two, maybe. Okay. So uh, how many men has is Jonathan leading into battle? One. Okay. So he's taking on a Philistine army with one guy. And, and one guy of- who backs him up, by the way. Yeah, he does. And they only have one sword between the two of them. Yeah. (laughs) Bit of a problem. Um, Jonathan's full of faith, but I would say he's not being foolhardy. Because look what happens next, starting in verse 8. Jonathan said, come on then, we'll cross over toward them and let them see us. Hmm. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Okay. So when I picture this, 
I think of an old cowboy movie. You know, that there uh, maybe a wagon train is making its way from one place to another, and they come into the valley surrounded by mountains on both sides, and it's dark inside the valley. And as they're riding along in single file, what do you know is going to happen? They're going to get There's ambushed. Going to be yeah, yeah. And this is Jonathan. He's in the bottom. And the Philistines have the high ground. They're way at the top. It's a steep cliff. And Jonathan is in a very vulnerable position. So he decides to do what? Strange? What does he decide to do? Let's show ourselves to them. Uh, Let's spring the trap. Let's give them a target. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so he says there, if they say to us, wait there, we'll come up to you. We will stay where we are and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up, then we'll take that as a sign the Lord has given to us. What should the Philistines have done when enemies expose themselves in a vulnerable position? Kill them. Take them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, they're, they're high. They've got the weapons. They can throw the weapons. They can come down on them. Right. They, and they have lots of ranged weapons, the Philistines. They could throw spears. They could throw bow and arrow. They could use a slingshot. They could throw rocks and sticks. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sure these are trained soldiers. So I'm sure they had standing orders. Whenever that happens, do it. They, Jonathan says, well, I'm going to show myself and see what happens. Because if they say, come up to me, what is that a sign of? That God's in it. Because that's not normally what you would say in a military situation. And from a human perspective, the Philistines might have been tempted to allow that to happen. Why? Oh, they want to torture him. They want to get information from him. Sure. And what possible damage can two guys with one sword do to them? Right? Nothing. So they see that Jonathan makes that claim to see if God is really in this. He shows themselves. And what do they say? Verse 11. Well, it says, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan (laughs) said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Yeah. By the way, where's Saul? Still (laughs) under the tree. (laughs) Maybe drink three. Maybe some of his 600 are taking turns fanning him so that, you know, he keeps nice and cool. And uh, Bob, get me another pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> Not this one. It's too squishy. Get me another one. But it's interesting the difference in the leadership that's being shown here. And j- verse 13 says, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. Why does it say he used his hands and feet? Well, it's a steep cliff. Absolutely. And when you're going up a steep cliff, you can't use your weapons. Yeah. And um, notice that the armor bearer was right behind him. Welcome to leadership. You don't command people to do what you're not willing to do. Mm. He leads by example. And what happens at the end of verse 13 and 14? It says, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet and his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Unbelievable. Isn't that something? Mm. I mean, Jonathan must have gone like lightning. First of all, he had to kill one of them to get another sword, right? Um, Because they only had one between the two of them. They only had one sword between them. Yeah, he had to get another one because someone had to have his back. They would have been just going with all possible intensity. And consider the risk that Jonathan was taking. I mean, he could have at any moment lost his life. Why was Jonathan willing to take this risk? Because he knew he had, the Lord was, was in it with him. Right. He was confident. He was not going with his own strength. Yes, he used his own strength, but he wasn't just depending on his own strength. He's depending on God to intervene. Because even though he killed 20 men in, the, in half an acre, there were hundreds and hundreds more, right? Yeah, they could always call for backup. Yeah, they couldn't, they can't take on the entire army alone. It looks like a fool's errand unless God was in it. And we read in verse 15. It said, then panic struck the whole army. 
those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and the raiding parties and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Wow. And was it coincidence that an earthquake happened just at that moment? No, obviously God sent the earthquake. (laughs) Jonathan, in great faith, climbs up the mountain, takes on an impossible enemy, and God shows up. And where was Saul? Verse 16? (laughs) Under this tree. (laughs) (laughs) And in verse 16, what does the narrator tell us? It says, Saul's lookout at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. So Saul is still sitting under the pomegranate tree, doing nothing, surrounded by his 600 fighting men, while Jonathan defeats the Philistine army almost single-handedly. Look at the contrast. And look at Saul's immediate response when he hears about the battle. Read it to us, Nathan. Saul's lookout at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, muster the forces and see who has left us. When they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. Does Saul's response surprise you? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Why? So you see the enemy running away. You should go chase after them. That should be your first response. Let's take out as many of them as possible. But instead... (laughs) He's like, oh, who's going to get all the glory for this? <laughs> is that what he was saying? Yeah. He huh. wanted to know who was missing. He was not eager to jump into the battle. He wanted to know who was responsible yeah, well, for this. What happened? How did this happen? Oh, it was Jonathan? Oh, he's going to get all the glory? And, and notice the narrator making fun of him that his lookouts saw the army. Saul wasn't close enough to even see what was happening. His lookout saw it. He was far removed from the action. And then finally, in verse 20, Saul takes some action. It says, then Saul and all of his men assembled and went to the battle. Then that happened. They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other (laughs) with their swords. Those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp, went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, then they joined in the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel and the battle moved on. Wow. So an overwhelming victory because of the earthquake, threw them into confusion, disarray, they're killing each other. The... uh, The dispirited Israelites that had been hiding from the Philistines came out of their caves and joined the fight. And verse 23, remind us, who won the battle? The Lord. On that day, the Lord saved Israel. Huh. By the way, who should have been leading this charge? Saul. Saul. Yeah. But instead, I picture him kind of taking up the rear, and as everyone's running away, he just like throws a pomegranate in the general direction of the (laughs) Philistine army. (laughs) We're being a little bit harsh on Saul, but uh, maybe it's so um, he deserves it because in verse 26, he finally gets to the field of battle. And what does he do first? What does he do? Saul bound the people under an oath saying, cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. Did you see the irony in this? What has Saul been doing all day? Well, yeah, he just threw, just threw his pomegranate <laughs> away, and right, he's been he's been chowing down on food. He's probably engorged on food. <laughs> he's got pomegranate stain all down the front of his shirt, and <laughs> and he tells no one's allowed to eat. Is that sound military strategy to tell an army in battle they can't eat? No. Why? They need to keep up their energy. Yeah. That's not the time for fasting. Yeah. If you've watched any kind of medieval movie or. Roman based or something, you've seen sword fights. That is hard work. Right. I mean, that is right. Or, or if you've LARPed live action role playing with, uh, with buffer weapons. Yeah. It's (laughs) it's tiring work. I've heard from friends (laughs) who I've been hitting with a buffer sword. (laughs) (laughs) So he gives terrible command. Notice how he says it. Cursed be anyone eats food before evening comes because, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. Do you notice anything that's repetitive there? 
What is he focused on? Myself. Me. Me. Myself. I. This is all about me, people. Let's keep it focused in the right direction. But in verse 27, we read, Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath, so he reached out the end of his staff that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb. And he raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Well, so that made sense. You're hungry. You've been fighting all day. He uh, had some honey. But Saul found out. And what happened next in verse 43? Does Saul know Jonathan's the one that fought the battle? Yeah, uh, yeah, because he because Jonathan was missing. Huh. It says then Saul said to Jonathan, "Tell me what you have done." So Jonathan told him, "I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff," and then he says, "And now I must die." And Saul said, "May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan." He Saul gave the what penalty of death to anyone who ate, and when his son inadvertently broke his command, didn't know it, it made it, but broke it. He says he's going to kill his own son. Does this seem odd to you? Yeah. I mean, what would transform Saul from a victorious, brave warrior who had defeated Jabesh Gilead to this weak, anemic, non-warrior who's willing to kill his own son for being successful? Pride, jealousy. Yeah. I think you're right. I think what destroyed Saul's ability to lead was that he fell into the death trap that so many leaders often fall into, and that is pride. Saul had a deep-seated need for the approval of his followers. He wanted to be seen as the great warrior king, and he wanted his followers to recognize that. I mean, some of our listeners may have realized that in chapter 13, I skipped ahead, because in verse 2 and following, what do we read? Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him, and 1,000 were with Jonathan. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So this was a scene that happened long before the battle that we've just described, uh, led by Jonathan and messed up by Saul, his father. In this scene, Jonathan and Saul went out in order to do battle. Saul had twice as many men as Jonathan, but what happened? Jonathan won. And what was the news report? Saul won. Was that true? No. Well, in the sense that he's the king <laughs> and this was part of his forces. <laughs> Saul sent out propaganda. He lied and said, I won the victory when his son had. He wanted to be seen as being the strong, victorious king. His public image was everything. And then, when Samuel didn't show up at, uh, on time at Gilgal to offer sacrifices of thanks to the Lord, Saul went ahead, unlawfully took matters into his own hands. And when Samuel showed up, he says, what have you done? And how did Saul reply? When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, he said, I thought, now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. And then Samuel points out, you've done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And why did Saul not keep the Lord's command? What was his motivation for disobedience? Nathan, did you notice it? He wanted to win. He wanted the victory. And he said, when I saw the men were scattering. Oh, no. I'm losing their focus. I'm not the center of attention. I'm not the proud, victorious king leader that I want to be seen to be. And if they start turning away from me, 
I will turn away from my Lord. Now, in all of these instances, Saul was more concerned about what the people might think about him than what God's opinion might be. That's why Saul lied about who won the battle at Gibeah. That's why he's ready to murder his son in Beth Avon. The answer is pride. The problem is pride. His primary concern was his reputation with his people. Look, this extended story is a case study in leadership. Two leaders were placed in the identical difficult situation. But while Jonathan's success exceeded expectations, Saul was a spectacular failure. Why did Jonathan succeed? Because he was willing to risk a bold strategy. And he was willing to do it, take on an impossible task because he believed God was with him. He had faith that God would show up. Saul? No. He wasn't willing to take the risk because what if it didn't work? What if his reputation was hurt? The pride of Saul kept him from acting with boldness, acting with faith in his God. When leaders become preoccupied with people's opinions, they cannot act with the bold faith demonstrated by Jonathan. Nathan Vicky, have you ever seen this principle played out in life? People so concerned with optics that they are unable to act with bold faith? Well, I think that's pretty common. We, we, we just talked about going to a Christian brother who, or sister who is sinning, knowing that's what God wants us to do, knowing that is what God wants us to do. And yet it's very easy not to do that because we're afraid. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just having a conversation with some of my friends at church about, you know, they talk about the seven deadly sins, which is not a biblical no. category. But, you know, you look at pride on there and you're like, pride, really? <laughs> you know, like, is that, <laughs> is that really bad? Well, yeah. I mean, wars are fought over pride. If you look at the world stage right now, this, uh, this situation in Ukraine is being fought over pride. It's being pro fought over pride. Mm. And yeah. the reality is, is that what's horrifying is it's because of pride that it's going to be perpetuated. A and, and war is continuing to destroy people and individuals because I don't want to back down. I don't want to feel humiliated. And, and it, uh, it works on the macro level. It also works on the micro level in our own personal lives. You know, how many marriages do I know that have fallen apart because a husband or wife couldn't just say, you know what, I was wrong. Mm. Uh, and it's just not even like a sinful issue, just, just you know, normal interrelational things, but the pride just gets in the way. And so their whole marriage falls apart because they're not willing to have a conversation and maybe humble themselves a little bit. I find it interesting to note that the people who plant churches tend to be kids right out of school. The people who do not plan churches tend to be older experienced pastors with decades of, uh, of track record working with God. I think it's because sometimes as we get older, we're so concerned to preserve our reputation. We're so concerned with keeping what we've earned that we're not willing to risk. What if God doesn't show up? What would be my legacy? Friends, that's, that's just pride. That's saying I am not willing to accomplish great things. What we need are people like Moses who can stand up before Pharaoh and say, let my people go knowing you can't do it, but God will when he shows up. Caleb at the end of his life saying, let me add it. Let me add it to the promised land. I know that my God will show up and I want him to use me and I'll take the risk. If I lose, I lose. But if I win, look what I've won. Saul lost his ability to lead Israel into battle when his overwhelming concern for his reputation prevented him from acting with the bold faith that Jonathan displayed. How can we lose our ability to lead God's people effectively? When our concern for our reputations make us so risk averse that we're not willing to trust that God will show up. Look, pride kills faith. Pride is a death trap for the leaders of God's people. When optics matter most, we cannot lead with bold faith. Because if God doesn't show up, we'll look bad. 
But if we try and lead God's people without God, we can never succeed. Without faith, we know that it's impossible to please God. And now here we've learned without faith, it's impossible to lead God's people. Look, pride is a leader's death trap. Don't fall into it. Pride kills faith. How could we lose our ability to lead God's people effectively? When we are more concerned about our own reputation than moving forward boldly in faith. By the way, whose approval are you looking for? I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more about this educational, nonprofit organization, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by rating it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're enjoying it. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of 1 Samuel. You won't want to miss it.